Hello, Daniel Holmesy, Director of the Neighborhood Empowerment Network here in San Francisco. Behind me, our City Hall, where today we're gonna to host the first ever NEN Disaster Resilience Summit. One of the key elements of today's program will be an opportunity for me to share with the attendees the brand new Empower Communities program, which we've been developing for the last seven years here in the city with about eight different neighborhoods. We'll also be getting a presentation by Patrick Ottolini, the Chief Resilience Officer for the City and County of San Francisco. Patrick will be updating everyone on the work he's been doing the last few years in his position, as well as previewing the direction that he wants to take with the new resilience strategy for the city. Let's tune in right now and find out what happened. Right now we're going to jump in and try and get back on schedule and take a few minutes now and share with you a little bit about what we've been doing in San Francisco, uh, inspired by LaToya and, and her experience in, in Katrina uh, and in New Orleans and other places around the country. So with that, I'm going to jump right in and start sharing with you how we're going to make sure that every neighborhood has a LaToya Cantrell in it when something happens. And I want to be very clear that that, you know, Patrick and I talk about this, you know, is that it isn't always, it doesn't have to be about a massive earthquake. It could be a large residential fire. We can have hyperlocal events like the landslides up in, uh, you know, Telegraph Hill a few years ago. It, it doesn't always have to be on CNN and Wolf Blitzer for it to qualify for being a disaster. If you lose your home and you lose your community, that's a disaster. And I don't care how many people are sharing that story. For you, that's a time of crisis. And so we're gonna jump in right now and talk about how we can make sure that no matter what happens where in the city, communities can come together. So with that, uh, just to be clear that the mayor actually uh, has said this before, we did go back to the future in 2007. And to give you some visuals um, that may point back to what LaToya was talking about, uh, what we saw when we went to New Orleans is that if you take the water away after a flood and after a major earthquake, it all looks alike, right? So there you saw the marina. Here's a home in the Ninth Ward that was swept off its foundation by a barge. Here's a mansion on Knob Hill that was burned to the ground um, after the fire. This image right here um, actually has become sort of a, a keynote moment in our in this presentation. This is this is in the ninth ward, and you know I really want to like ground this conversation and think about this for a minute. In the ninth ward, were literally hundreds of vulnerable residents, disabled seniors, children that weren't able to self evacuate out of the ninth ward on the day of uh, Katrina. And the reason why was because it was the last day of the month, the 25th practically. How much money do you have in the bank if you're on Social Security on the 25th of the month? Enough to buy, rent a car or get a, get a bus ticket? No, so you had to stay behind. I want you to think about what it must have been like when the levee broke in the neighborhood and the water came over into the community and I want, you know, we've all sort of like hung out like in the bathtub and moved the water around and things like that. Imagine what it must have been like for it to be 75 years old in the water and you have cars and houses in the water with you with such power that a 6,000 pound car can be tossed around like a poker chip and then a house put on top of it. And then the question is, put your grandmother in that mix. That's what this is about. That's what this is, that event in the North Ninth Ward was completely avoidable. Everybody knew the levees were going to fail. Everybody knew that the seniors were broke. Everybody knew that there was a school bus yard lot full of buses down the street that were left to drown. Everybody knew it, and yet no one did anything about it. And that's what Mary Lee's talking about right now with us in a very polite way, is that we know better. And that's what today is all about. So when we look at this program, we'll close out and say, sure, we saw that, and then we saw this. And let's not forget your colleague, Hal Rourke, who was an amazing leader with LaToya that sat Mayor Lee and I down with Doug Allers from the Harbor Kennedy School. Um, and then we have uh, Jeremy Irons and, and Sarah Dennis as well. And basically showed us a professional grade recovery plan for their community that was done without any funds from the city council. And we were blown away. And we knew that was the benchmark that we wanted for our neighborhoods today so they could all recover tomorrow. So with that, we had the lessons learned, if you will, right? We need to move ownership down to the neighborhood level. Latoya said it 25 times, now it's 26, right? We need to focus on leadership development. Now we're at 27, right? Great neighborhoods in San Francisco don't just happen. 
They are a result of leadership in that community, making sure that that neighborhood stays great. We need to prepare for times of stress by working together on everyday issues. There are things that come before us every day, good and bad, that we can work together on to just build out our interoperability. Let's plan a block party. Let's get a stop sign. Let's stop the crack house on the corner. Guess what? It doesn't matter how you work together, it's just that you do work together. And I honor my friends in TR, uh, as they, I believe in the Marines, they say, don't never exchange business cards on the battlefield. Right? And I, it took me a while to figure that out, but it really makes sense. That is not the time to figure out how you're going to cover each other's you-know-what. Got your six, right? Is that the, uh, the line there, right? Um, we need to leverage existing assets and networks in our communities and, and to gain participation. We don't need to go in and start a, a resilient society in every neighborhood. Talk to the neighborhood association. Talk to the merchant association. Talk to the community garden group. They're already working on resilience. Bring them to the table, honor their work, and let them contribute to this mission. They already get it. And lastly, kits are important, and I think uh, our colleagues over at DEM there and SF72 talk about this. You got to have stuff, but it's also who is in your, in your kit that matters as well. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now let's talk about San Francisco. Those of you who have seen this presentation, uh, please just uh, accommodate uh, us one more time. Um, first of all, the issue is negative. You're all in here today because you get it. Let's be honest, how many times you've sat at a dinner party and trying to start a conversation about disaster resilience, and everyone's like, yeah, when's that dessert coming around? Right? And you're like, you know, geek alert, like, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. What did Donald Trump say today? Oh, let's talk about that for an hour. Because he's so relevant, right? Um, there is no hard event window. Patrick, give me the statistics. 60% chance, 30 years, 19% chance, it's, it's overwhelming. It sounds like we're at the, at the horse track, you know, trying to explain to people why there needs to be a sense of urgency about something that we can't tell them when it's gonna happen. But we can also tell you though that we do know that it doesn't have to be an earthquake, it could be a very large heat event. And we've actually had a growing momentum of heat waves in San Francisco, and the statistics show that we will have up to 20 major heat waves a year in San Francisco moving forward as our climate begins to change. Why is that important? Well, how many people here have air conditioning in their apartment or their home in San Francisco? Right? And LaToya was just telling me about the power outages in New Orleans during a major storm one time, that for like six weeks or something crazy like that. One week, they had no electricity in New Orleans, and you can imagine what it was like in the summer for the seniors trying to stay alive in that environment. It must have been dreadful. But we have a unique situation, and you know, it's kind of funny because it's all people talk about nowadays, right? So here's a city and county, San Francisco, great city. We love this city. It looks like so many other great cities. You know, you go up the coast, Portland, Seattle. We have our downtown surrounded by our neighborhoods. It's a wonderful city, right? But the truth is, it's not like every other city. What percentage of San Francisco's housing is rental? 70%, that is correct. In most cities, it's actually 70% home ownership, right? The truth is that San Francisco is a very complex city to govern and do this kind of work because frankly, people come and go all the time. Since 1992, 60% of San Franciscans have moved out. And that's an old statistic. Just in the last few years alone, 8,000 Latino families moved out of the mission by itself. 48% of San Franciscans don't speak English at home as their primary language. 30% weren't even born in California. So the truth is, is that we have a city that is in constant gyration. The average LGBTQ community member stays in San Francisco for only five years. And so really, if you want to look at San Francisco and the mission ahead of us, we sort of have to look at it more like it's a cruise ship, right? You know, it pulls into town. We got Julie McCoy at the deck, you know, greeting us all on board. Come on! The SS San Francisco, it's going to be great. Hey, when you get into your neighborhood, check in with your local neighbor association and meet your community, right? Or maybe attend next year's block party, right? Get to know your folks. We have got to move the opportunity to connect and bring people together in a very direct way at our communities in San Francisco. That's why this year we launched a program called Neighbor Fest, which is how to throw the world's greatest block party, right? And get everyone in the block out. At the same time, learn how to do mass feeding and care. Right? Because you already know who's got a barbecue, you already know who's got a table, and you already know who cares about each other. And we'll talk more about that program another time, but it's a really exciting development. So with that, you know, we have an opportunity to address a big challenge, that is we have an unstable social capital environment. Dr. Daniel Aldrich, Purdue University, clearly shows that neighborhoods that are connected, that care about each other, consistently weather stress events much better than those that don't. 
right? So that's a very big um, challenge that we have to overcome. We need to acquire the complete skill set, and it is very difficult. Uh, I, I yield to my colleague over there, Betsy Eddy, who's up in uh, Diamond Heights all the time. Betsy's passionate about disaster resilience. That means she has to be passionate about traffic, she has to be passionate about lifelines, she has to be passionate about land use. All those things go into a resilient community. And learning how to negotiate the city's planning code and, and DBI is a lifelong mission. Right, Mr. Odellini? That's a, a big priority, right? So what we did is we created something called the Neighborhood Empowerment Network. We are not short of organizations that care about our neighborhoods, right? So we decided to bring everyone together to say, what if we work together and engage our communities in a sustained dialogue about about their resilience, right? So who do we have in this club? We have our NEN universe, right? So everyone comes together in the universe. It's a beautiful thing. It's a very expensive graphic. I paid for it a long time ago. I gotta keep using it, right? So our city partners, look at the wonderful agencies that we have up here. They're not all up there, right? It's just impossible to articulate how many of our community benefit from our city agencies. Just alone for the, the Arts Commission, for example, and the way it spends money in our neighborhoods bringing together around the arts. The number one community organizing platform in New Orleans post-Katrina, according to LSU, was the people that put on the floats in the parade, not the neighborhood associations, right? It was the, those people, because they were year-round organizing and come together, managing volunteers, managing donations. They know how to get stuff done, so they just repurpose those skill sets in order to manage the recovery of their community. Our nonprofit partners, we have an amazing group of partners that we work with every day. Of course, we had our Team Rubicon up here. We have the San Francisco Realtors. We have the Interfaith Council, the Red Crosses over here rebuilding together. We also have SF Card. Uh, the truth is, is that SF Card has been an essential partner to us over the last few years, managing many of our products. And uh, Susie, I'm gonna, Susie Schmidt, stand up. Stand up. Susie Schmidt has been a huge anchor partner with us with her colleague, uh, Brian Whitlow, and in the spirit of resilience, Susie's moving to LA, unfortunately, so we lost her, but we just wanna thank publicly Susie Schmidt's leadership in, in our neighborhood, so thank you, Susie, very much. Uh, we, we were blessed to have you as, as, for the time we had, uh, but now someone's gotta fill her shoes. Who's it gonna be? Maybe one of my interns, right? Um, our private sector partners, Nextdoor, Neighborland, Appalicious, AT&T, PG&E, Microsoft. Microsoft has stepped forward this year and actually given us a $100,000 grant to help build out our toolkit and focus on using technology to empower our residents to be just as performance oriented as we are at work and every day. And Scott Movey, Scott was here a minute ago. I wanna thank Scott. There he is, Scott, stand up for a second. Come on, there he is. Truly, truly a great partner uh, in our work here, right? And then our academic institutions, you heard from Jennifer Summit, UCSF has been a great partner, MIT Urban Risk Lab helped us design all these human-centered design activities that you see these maps we run in our neighborhoods, the MIT Urban Risk Lab helped us develop that as well. Of course, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, as the mayor mentioned, and even Massey University in New Zealand has been a great partner in helping us understand resilience. We've created something called the Empower Communities Program. In a nutshell, it coordinates the deployment of the resources and expertise of the members of the Neighborhood Empowerment Network in support of the community's pursuit of resilience. So I know a lot of words right there, but the bottom line is we take a servant leadership approach towards this work. In other words, we plan with people, not for them. And that's a very big statement in our business, is that residents want to participate in our work, but they all want to participate in terms that they understand. And we believe if we work with them at that level, they'll have more ownership after the process is completed, not simply filling in the checks and boxes on a traditional sort of model. If you look here, this is our new iterative sort of design, that's our, our logic model, if you will. The way it starts off and hop down here is that, we start off with a resilience council. So what we do is we go into a neighborhood and we say, who are all the people that care about this neighborhood today? Not just about disaster resilience, but who are the people that show up at City Hall for hearings? Who are the people that are organizing block parties? Who are the people that are running the nonprofits that make a difference in this neighborhood? We bring them together. We say, here's the opportunity. What would you like to do? Do you want to move forward or not? It's a permission-based deployment. If they don't want to work with us, we will not force them to work with us, right? We have yet to have a neighborhood say no. We then do a risk hazard assessment. Uh, Cindy Comerford and her team in the Department of Health have created this brand new system that helps us create a profile snapshot for our neighborhoods so they understand what the challenges are in their community. I mentioned heat waves before. In the Bayview, yes. In the Sunset, no. So designing a resilient action plan for a neighborhood has to be customized in San Francisco because no two neighborhoods are alike. They write a vision and mission statement. They do goals and objectives. 
the bottom line is they actually run these human-centered design exercises that you see here, where they center on vulnerable populations, and they do a gap analysis, right? A swab, a SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunity, threats, around a myriad of issues that they um, have to confront. We then complete the process by designing, taking their goals and objectives, organizing them at the individual, organizational, and community level. A lot of our work focuses on, focuses on individual preparedness, which is important, but it's really about the organizations in that neighborhood that are gonna hold those folks' communities together, like the Broadmoor Improvement Association, like the local YMCA, like Providence Baptist Church. And then we divide those capacities by connection, capacity, and resources. Right? You got to know each other to care about each other. You need to be able to work together to get stuff done, and you need stuff to get that work done. So those are the three areas that we parse this conversation out. Then finally, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And the last ring are all the different hazards that people might want to work on. Pandemic, fire, heat wave, whatever they have. We have eight neighborhoods right now that have completed their system right now. We have Miraloma Park, The Sunset, OMI, Cayuga, Merced Extension Triangle, Diamond Heights, Brotherhood Way, and last but not least, Bayview. Eight neighborhoods that have now completed their Resilient Action Plan. Several are deep into their implementation, but six of them are brand new and next year um, go into full implementation. So we have eight plans and we have one mission, and that is everybody lives, and everybody stays. I think I just got to move the screen over, right? So, and everybody stays. That's what our communities are committed to. Not only living and surviving the disaster, but actually staying a community afterwards. And that's the new line that Latoya, I think, really inspired us to take on. So what's next? And for that, I want to bring up GL Hodge, uh, one of our co-leads of uh, Resilient Bayview, um, to talk about something that happened this year for him that he brought back to the Bayview and actually now has become an enterprise strategy for our work. Good morning. You really don't know how I've been looking forward to this meeting. Usually when you've been outside of earthquake for five, six years, all your momentum goes down. No investments, no money. People don't even want to talk about it. They forgot what happened. But with Daniel around, you can't do that, okay? <laughs> He's going to keep you going. And I have to say I follow in his footsteps because we live this, okay? How many people have a personal plan in this room? How many people have a phone number outside the state? How many people, kids know where to go when the disaster hit? Hands start going down. You're taking care of yourself and ain't taking care of your kids is what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, let's get down to the real nitty gritty. Uh, I had a chance to go uh, to Kingston, Jamaica. Now usually when you're going to Jamaica, you're not going to Kingston. Okay, it's not the most tourist attractive site there. But we had a chance to go to Kingston, and I went with Daniel, and I thank you for giving me that opportunity. My dad was Jamaica. Never had been to my dad's home city. Had a chance to go, so it's my ancestral home site. Jamaica has virtually everything that San Francisco has. Earthquakes, hurricane. Now, we don't have volcanoes, but they have volcanoes. They have floods. Spent two days visiting the neighborhoods that were predominantly poor and all situated in harm's way. Now, I want to set that example for you as we go. We went to a community called Mel Brooks Heights to see the tire wall. The first day we visited Mel Brooks Heights, a squatter community perched up on a hill that was very prone to severe erosion meaning every time it rained, the roads would wash away. So the people couldn't get in and out of their community. The, go the local government used USAID grants to hire local residents, local residents, to build a retainer wall to preserve the essential road to protect their homes. Now what they did was, they gave them some money, they went out and bought some used tires. They took the used tires and got some string and put with them, but they wouldn't got parachute string so it wouldn't rot out. They loaded those tires with dirt and gro gravel and rocks, and they built a retainer wall so that they could take care of their community. Now, we're not talking about Los Angeles, we're not talking about New York, we're not talking about San Francisco. We're talking about a third world country, y'all. 
a third world country that put they self out there to take care of their own community so that they could be able to strive. They didn't get any uh, uh, people come down to do surveys to take care of this kind of stuff. After that, the local team became the biggest supporters of this disaster resiliency because they knew that they could take care of themselves. And this is going to get deeper as we go. And I know they got some pictures up there showing them to you. Take a look at it, y'all. You know, there wasn't no paved streets out there. Next place we went to, Palisaders Shore Protection Project. Later that day, we visited a community that had been destroyed by a hurricane. They had a 20-foot wall to protect them from a hurricane, and the hurricane still got them, washed them away. The neighborhood was destroyed, and the buildings were left to provide a seawall for future surges. They, the city would not even build there anymore because of the seawall. So they just left houses down there. Well, let's, let's see what the neighborhood did. The neighborhood was destroyed. The buildings were left to provide a seawall. Squatters live there today and pay rent to a self-appointed landlord. So one guy moved back in first, and he started renting out those squatters' buildings. People stayed in that community. They wasn't going anywhere, but they even hooked up their own electricity. So if the government's got, not going to help you, the reason I'm bringing this up is that the people are going to do what they have to do, y'all. And I'm saying y'all because I'm in Texas. I'm letting you know we've got to include everybody, if you don't know that terminology. Y'all, us, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Next place we went to visit was Duhaney Park Community. Now this is a good one, okay. Located at the end of the storm wash that leads to the ocean. So what you got is open sewers all around the community. And whenever it rains, it just floods all the time. I experienced more intensive flooding due to the development of expensive homes on the top of the nearby mountain. They built luxurious homes on the top of a mountain with no drainage. So where did the water drain? Right down on the people below with no money. Residents routinely have their homes washed away, need to go downstream to collect parts of their homes and rebuild them and bring them back. The local community center, a health clinic, partnered with the Kingston Department of Emergency Management and created their own resiliency strategy, which included creating a map of their assets. Now, we didn't go to Appalachia's, which they, I know they wish they had. They didn't go to Microsoft. They went and got paper bags, taped them together, and asset mapped their community to know where everything was. Now, they didn't ask for city monies to do this. They asset mapped their own thing. They created their own hub. They needed the generator but couldn't get one from the city until after the flood. Now, the city has a good emergency plan. They will give you a generator, but they won't let you keep the generator. So you can get a generator if it floods, but you can't get the generator to them if it floods. Wow. Real bright, huh? So I'm proud to say that Providence Baptist Church bought that community center a generator so that they have that generator. <laughs> give me just a minute. Lesson, lessons for the Bayview. We partner with Appalachians to asset map our own neighborhood, specifically the Third Street Corridor. We decided to create three nodes which had open spaces at their center, which people would most likely congregate at after a disaster. This year we'll be activating the first node called the Town Center, and Providence Baptist Church will be acting as the anchor institution. One thing that you need to know is that Every one of these eight resilient communities are anchored by a faith-based institution. Like they say in baseball, if you build it, they will come. Right now, when we have a disaster, they will come. Final thoughts, we're not here to say that organizations don't want to help us after a disaster. We just know that there's only so much help to go around. We want to be able to take care of ourselves. 
What we're saying is that we don't believe in the top-down theory. We believe in the bottom-up theory. We're going to take care of ourselves. If we can help other neighborhoods, we will. But you need to help us to be able to take care of ourselves. No city can do mass feeding. A congregation can organize before a city can organize. A city can organize before a state can organize. A state can organize before a government organize. We organize now, and you need to do the same. GL's too kind. It's, uh, as anyone knows in this work, there are days when you get up and you're like, it'd be so easy to drive an Uber car, you know, and just be able to like put your aid in and go home and watch Curry stuff into the three-pointer. Um, and it is invaluable to go out in a community and have people like GL equal or exceed your passion. So I just want to thank GL uh, for his leadership out there. He's been doing a lot longer than I. One time we should get GL up here to talk about his story of resilience. It's really powerful um, what he's gone through. So let's give you a quick snapshot of how we're going to operationalize this. So this is what we think is the world that we're going to live in. So this is your house right now. You see all the lifelines that come into your house every day, right? No matter how much we pour into our sewer system and our power systems, guess what? They're probably going to turn off at least for a few days after disaster, maybe longer. In Christchurch, New Zealand, they had to use porta potties for two years. So the reality is, is that, you know, it's going to be likely that we're going to have to, like, live without the stuff we count on every day, like internet access. I know it terrifies my kids when I say that, but that's just how it goes, right? So, so the power turns off to your home. Well, who are you going to turn to? So we think the first people you're going to turn to are your neighbors, right? So you're most likely going to reach out to them and say, hey, do you have food? Do you have water? Do you have a blanket I can borrow? But the most likelihood is that they're probably just as prepared as you are, so that's probably not going to go as far as you need. We think then people are most likely to reach out to a local organization. So in this community, the resident reaches out to a local faith based institution. Now the good news is, is that we want to go into neighborhoods and identify those organizations and turn them into anchor institutions, right? Because when the event happens, when that individual reaches out to that organization, the good news is they've already reached out to the local pharmacy, the local, uh, another nonprofit down the street, a supermarket, and then a school nearby, and have already figured out how they're going to feed and shelter everyone in the neighborhood. So when you do reach out to that institution, they already have a network up and running locally to meet all of your needs, right? And that's what the anchor institution drives every day. We believe that if we set these up across the city in, an, in a well-organized fashion, that each one will be supporting the community around them. But what happens when they hit a wall, they need a generator, they need some other use? Guess what? They can reach out to each other, right? And so the thought is, is that if we make this investment now, like Latoya is saying, then when the event happens, we can actually feel competent that the neighborhoods that aren't getting the first response needs, because maybe they're on, on fire, they don't have a huge collapsed building crisis, um, those that will be vulnerable, the residents, the seniors, the disabled, will actually have a network in place already ready up and running to help them, and trained on these skills and capacities by working with everybody in this room today. Here's the bottom line, right, is we think a really successful node has a key group of stakeholders that come together on a regular basis and are committed to this mission, right? And they're constantly investing in their individual capacity and their community's capacity. If your Conuve operations plan doesn't include helping others, that is not a Conuve operations plan. That is a very selfish plan, and most likely you're not going to succeed anyhow, right? We need our, our stakeholder organizations to be conveners and bring people together, but they have to be champions for resilience. Patrick and I worked this year on a project called Bolton Brace, where we went out to all the neighborhood associations and asked them to promote the program, right? And we had a huge turnout, right, in that program. So the truth is, is that it's a, people are more likely to take information or advice from someone they know, not from a really good looking guy like Patrick, uh, and a shorter guy with a little pudgier next to him, right? So the bottom line is like, this is how we think that we're going to get the ball moving on preparedness activity in our neighborhoods, is having people they count on every day for their needs be the ones that challenge them to achieve these goals. Right? This is how the, the system lays out. We pull together our asset map. We then identify all the networks and all the institutions in the community. We then uh, build these cross-sector partnerships, train them on uh, incident command system. We then begin to train them on how to generate power, how to manage waste, all the workshops we're going to do today. And then lastly, what we want to do is have them be able to help everyone shelter. San Francisco, after a very large earthquake, will be the world's largest shelter island. 
right? Everyone's going to be sheltering. We often joke in our neighborhoods, who are going to be the vulnerable residents and people bring up homeless? And we always joke, well, then again, we're all going to be homeless. We'll probably learn a lot from them, right? So the truth is, is that just like in Jamaica, it was a very similar type of thing. The poorest country that we have, I've ever seen in my life taught me more about resilience than I could any day in one of our neighborhoods just by walking around and looking around. So in summary, here's what we know, right? Katrina, New Orleans, here's what we saw on TV. The truth is, is that when you look at the devastation though, not all of New Orleans was impacted the same way, right? And actually, if you looked at the maps and people that were thinking about it, they could have predicted this was exactly what was gonna happen and they could have told you where it was gonna happen. The bottom line here is San Francisco, our wacky little town, 49 square miles of insanity, but we love it, right? And it's kind of funny, like, you, when you move to San Francisco, you stop saying, I live in San Francisco, and you start saying, like, I live in the NOPA, or I live in the Mission, right? So really, we're very territorial uh, community, uh, sense around our communities, right? The truth is, in 89, I was in Noe Valley. Dad was up at his house with all the architects stranded in San Francisco, you know, sort of looking out over the city. And we were sitting on the stoop drinking the beers we'd bought for the baseball game. We thought everything was fine until we saw the smoke coming up to the north, and we knew nothing was fine in the marina at that point. The reality is, is that San Francisco is a very diverse city, not only culturally, but seismically. We actually have these maps now that are being presented, created by Cindy Comerford's team at the Department of Health. This shows the liquefaction zones in San Francisco and where you can see intense shaking. But we also can tell where people over 60 live in San Francisco. We can also say, who are people that live alone in San Francisco? We know where they are. And we also know people who actually identify themselves as living with a disability, right? So the bottom line is, we know when, it, we know where it will happen, we know who will be impacted, and we know who will be the first responder. And who's that gonna be? These folks right here, right? So the bottom line, 20% of San Francisco right now is covered by the Empower Communities program, right? Our goal is 100% as quickly as possible. And that all has to do with the budget, but that's another conversation, right? In the meantime, though, we want to make the system better and stronger. Today's workshops that you'll be able to participate on, communications, waste management, power generation, spontaneous volunteer. Uh, we're also gonna have a workshop on communications. Uh, it's gonna be able to bring people like you to the table and say, how can we design a new layer of uh, training to empower you to succeed after disaster when you're gonna be confronted with these challenges? So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Patrick Otolina to talk about the, his work today and his workshop, but we want you to stick around and help us carve this out because the bottom line is it won't work unless you help us design it. Thank you all very much. I want to do is talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing in San Francisco for the last decade and where we're going. So what you see up here, there's a few things I'm going to talk about briefly here because we want to get you into the workshop. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Community Action Plan for Seismic Safety, our Soft Story Retrofit Program, our Private Schools Program, which you heard the mayor mention this morning, and the place called the Epicenter where we do a lot of our community outreach work here in San Francisco, and the Lifelines Council, and then uh, ultimately 100 Resilient Cities, a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation that we've been engaged with for the last 18 months with the ultimate goal of creating a holistic resilient strategy for the city of San Francisco. But let's go back to 1989. Let's talk about that earthquake and let's talk about what happened after that. How many times this morning have you heard that this government should be bottom up? That this process should be bottom up? Well, that's exactly what we did. And unfortunately, he's not here this morning, but I need to give Lawrence Cornfield a ton of credit, who was with the Department of Building Inspection for 25 years, and tirelessly roused the community to get together to talk about what does it mean for us to be safe from earthquakes in San Francisco? And that's when we started CAPS, the Community Action Plan for Seismic Safety. This was a 10-year-long process and asked questions in the engineering community that we had never asked before. I'll give you an example. When we talk about seismically retrofitting a building, we're usually talking about working from the foundation to the roof of that structure. Well, there was this crazy idea looking at our city's soft story buildings. Well, if we, if we retrofit the building, we're going to have to relocate the residents. The whole point of this is to keep people in their homes. So what if we look at just fixing the ground floor? We know it's not gonna retrofit the full building, but ultimately it's gonna make that building so it's preventing collapse, and hopefully people will be able to shelter in place. That's a huge step forward to get the engineering community to universally agree that yes, this is a great step, this is a partial retrofit, this is how we should start thinking about fixing these buildings. I think a lot of times we talk about fixing these structures in terms of construction type, whether they're wood framed or unreinforced masonry, but we also gotta talk about the occupancy. Who are the people in these buildings? Are these young school kids? Kids? Are these elderly folks with limited mobility? We need to be thinking dynamically about that as well. 
So after CAPS was, was uh, finalized uh, towards the end of, end of uh, uh, 2010, it ultimately came up with 17 key policy recommendations that were then turned into this plan next to it, the 30-year earthquake safety implementation program, which you heard our city administrator mention this morning. Um, this breaks that down into 50 real tasks and makes it really simple. Uh, I've been with the city for about three years now, and I jokingly say that I was the only person that got to start with an instruction manual. So as long as I'm going down that list, things to, seem to be going pretty well. But the first one was no easy lift. It was looking at our city's soft story buildings, which I was just speaking about. Um, soft story buildings are buildings that have a lot of openings on the ground floor, uh, sometimes from garage doors or from commercial storefronts. And essentially what we're talking about is, is, is a lack of interior partitions and a lot of weight upstairs in the residences. So when this ground starts shaking, you're going to see that deficiency between the first and second floor, like you see here in this building and like you saw all over San Francisco after Loma Prieta. To give you an idea of the snapshot here, you know, we're about 125,000 folks in San Francisco, uh, about 70% renters, so a large majority of these folks do live in soft story buildings. It's about 150,000 privately owned structures, and it wasn't like when we started this process we could just go to a list of soft story buildings. It's not that simple. Uh, what we had to do is actually through lots of volunteers, we walked the streets of San Francisco and did a, did a high level survey to kind of understand about how many buildings we're talking about. But when the ordinance had passed and it came time to actually notice these people about these requirements, we had to really kind of take a step back and look at, okay, this ordinance is going to impact wood frame buildings. So that's a category we can define. Five or more residential units, there's another category that we can define. Uh, looking at three, two or more stories over a soft story condition. And buildings built before 1978. That group of buildings is essentially the buildings that we're concerned about under this mandatory program. Um, that means that we noticed about 6,700 buildings through this program. Um, these buildings uh, ultimately ended up being about a little over 5,000 that have to retrofit, but we gave these owners a year to comply with a screening process to hire a licensed design professional to just say if this building should be in or out of the program. And what's amazing is that we have a 99.9% .9 compliance rate, highest compliance rate of any seismic program in the country. So it's amazing to see San Francisco taking this very complex subject and making it very real for them. Um, the ordinance itself was signed on the anniversary of the uh, 1906 quake at about 514 in the morning a couple of years ago, and now we're deep into implementation. So when we started going out and talking to communities, um, this is where I need to give Mike a hilt from my staff a lot of credit, because we were trying to figure out how to visualize this. We didn't want to have a map with a bunch of dots on it that says your building is dangerous, because we haven't evaluated that property. That would be an unfair assumption. So what we had to do is look at this and also tell the elected officials this is not a marina district problem. If you watch the news in 1989, that's what it seemed like. But in reality, what we showed is that these types of buildings occur all over San Francisco and house all types of residents. Um, that was really important. And then also taking that and then breaking it down so we have a, an appropriate workflow. We broke these buildings down into four different tiers, and that sets your timelines for submitting permits and getting the work done. And this is not only to, uh, mainly to prioritize the highest risk buildings, but also to have an even keel workflow so we're not inundating our departments that are going to have to review, approve, and inspect these buildings. Tremendous amount of outreach was done. Um, the, the picture up here in the upper left is Mayor Lee and I meeting with the heads of about 20 private banks in 2013. And we went to the private banks and we said, hey, we're not asking you to do anything different. We don't want you to change your underwriting criteria. We don't want you to change your process. We just want you to come to the table and help us with this problem. And what you saw was an amazing thing. We've created our own public financing option, which I'll talk about in a moment, but to see these banks come forward and develop their own mechanisms and, and helping people refinance because they know they have to do this work was an incredible way to have this public-private relationship going on because we know financing these retrofits, a one-size-fits-all certainly does not, uh, uh, does not work in this situation. Some of the other things you see here, lots of educational events. Um, we always made sure to videotape these and put them up on our website so those that, people who couldn't attend a community event because they had to work or because they were taking care of children, could easily go on our website and access the information they needed. Um, there was a tremendous amount of outreach, too. The largest one of those outreach efforts uh, happened in 2014, right across the street here at Bill Graham Civic Auditorium, where we had an earthquake retrofit fair. Uh, we had over 3,000 members of the public. We had 160 vendors providing design services and consulting. Uh, contractors were there. Banks were there. Insurance companies were there. And what it was great is, so the, the, the property owner that had to comply with this ordinance could walk through the room and talk to six different contractors. And so we could try to avoid these kind of contractor fraud situations that you can see happening like we saw in New Orleans. So this was a great opportunity and, and it proved to be great in results too because people were getting connected in a way that we didn't even expect. And we're going to be having another one this year on April 18th. So uh, keep your ears open and eyes open for that next event. 
But to give you a snapshot of where we are, this, uh, this data is from November, so it's fairly current. And what we're seeing now, uh, as I mentioned, a little over 5,000 buildings that have to retrofit, still experiencing an incredibly high, high compliance rate. But what's impressive to me is that we're talking about the people that live in these buildings. It's about 120,000 San Franciscans, about 15% of our population, currently lives in a dangerous building and will live in a retrofitted building by 2020. That's a huge step forward, but it's still a really small bite at a very large apple when we talk about seismic risk. Our city's financing program, uh, we went live in December with this program. It's a way to get a loan from the city and actually pay it back through your property taxes over the term of about 20 years. And we went live in December, as I mentioned, we have $58 million in underwriting right now. So huge uh, uptick in this, in this interest. We're really excited to keep it going. And, uh, and, and I imagine that this is, just, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If we can get this right and we can fix soft story buildings this way, we can start fixing single family homes this way, we can start fixing our schools this way. So innovative finance is really important when we think about who's going to pay for this at the end of the day. Now I'm going to switch subjects a little bit and talk about our private schools. Uh, you heard the mayor mention some comments about that this morning and then Naomi talking about when we were in the thick of it uh, negotiating this policy. But the reality is, is that every child deserves to be educated in a safe place. And in California, starting in the 1970s, and really starting in the 1930s, we started looking at our public schools differently. Uh, we started treating them differently. For those of you who've ever seen a building permit that gets issued for a public school, it happens in Sacramento from the Division of State Architect. It does not happen here at the local jurisdiction. However, public schools, uh, private schools, excuse me, are subject to the local building department. Doesn't mean they're dangerous, it just means they're governed differently. So we spent a year and a half looking at this with our, with our working group, and ultimately we decided that the correct course of action was evaluation. If you require a retrofit, you know, these buildings are all different sizes, schools are in different capacities to be able to pay for it. So ultimately, evaluation was a fair way for these schools to understand that risk and then come up with a plan to address that risk. So whether, a, a, let's say, a more affluent school can fix that in a couple of years and a school that needs to do some more fundraising can take five to ten years, it's on their time and on their schedule working with their board, and that's the way it should be. Um, we just hit a deadline for this in, uh, in, in November, and I'm pleased to say that the, this program has a 93% compli uh, compliance rate currently. So I guess we're setting the bar high for our seismic programs. We're not accepting anything less than 90% compliance as we roll this out. But when we do it, we have to be talking to the public very appropriately. So we have a, a, a space down in South of Market called the Epicenter. This is kind of a pop-up collaborative space where we can have policy conversations, but also it's kind of like a big toy box for us. Uh, you can see in the background here, we built a mock house. So you can go in there and see what a typical residential foundation would look like and how you retrofit that, how you bolt that foundation, how you put plywood shear wall in the crawl space. And it's a great way to get people's hands on this that have never even been underneath their house. They don't know what's under there. And getting them to talk about some of these scary issues in, in a pretty open and, and, and calm way, trying to get away from this doom and gloom of the disaster while that's a very big reality. We've got to talk about it and connecting our community and talking to folks now about these issues. You also heard the mayor and Naomi both mention the Lifelines Council. Uh, this is something that was started by the mayor when he was a city administrator. Um, it, it, it gets everyone to the table. And I think when the mayor started that, that was the most important thing, is let's get these people to the table so we all know each other. Now here we are several years later, almost a decade later, and we had to actually start doing some work now that we all know each other. And that's when we did this, this study that you see here, the interdependency study. The inter interdependency study was done by Lori Johnson, but also had a tremendous amount of support from the city and staff, and took a repeat of the 1906 earthquake, modeled the 1906 earthquake and said, okay, Pacific Gas and Electric, what do your restoration timelines look like? And you can imagine the uncomfortable position that a lot of our utility providers were probably put in when they had to put that down on paper. But what you saw throughout the course of this process, they came back to the table and said, you know what, when we spoke a couple of months ago, we were, we were being a little conservative, here's what we really think. And to get them to be open and honest gives us a real snapshot of realizing how interdependent our utilities are. And so this gives us a five-year plan to help investigate and, and help either strengthen those interdependencies where we need to strengthen them or decouple them when we need to decouple them. 100 Resilient Cities has been a great inject of energy, um, but as you see as I've been talking before this, resilience is not new to San Francisco. Uh, this is something that we've been doing for a long time. So I think our challenge when we started working with the Rockefeller Foundation was how do we take this and marry it up midstream? And a lot, what that really meant was taking a step back. It was the last thing I really wanted to do at the time, to be honest, but to take a step back and say, okay, we talk about resilience all the time. We talk about community engagement all the time. What does this really mean? And we unpacked a lot through this process. As you can see, we have about 60 other cities or 70 other cities that are in the network right now, but ultimately this will round out to 100 cities. Um, this network has been amazing for me personally. To be able to talk to folks in other cities and get real talk 
I'm not talking to a, you know, a polished communications office that's staying on message. I'm talking to the people who are doing my job in that city. And no one really understands the pressures and the stresses that go along with that like those folks. To give you an idea of this timeline, uh, what we've been working on for the last 18 months, we've met with over 186 individuals, 31 city departments, 56 organizations, and through that process, a lot of you were involved in our working groups where we were asking a lot of questions. That was kind of phase two of our process where we had 86 diagnostic questions that we spent the summer answering. And ultimately, that led us to kind of this process that you see up here, talking about our shocks and stresses, looking at our focus areas, and then ultimately kind of thinking about those focus areas and what does that mean to move forward. And now we're in the final stages of wrapping up the City Resilience Strategy coming out in February of next year. Looking at phase one was, was in, in, my, in my opinion, really no surprise. If you're in San Francisco and you don't think we have to worry about earthquakes, you don't think we have to worry about sea level rise, you don't think we have to worry about housing affordability, well then welcome to San Francisco because this must be your first day. Uh, you know, this is something we've been thinking about for a long time, but this was a good way to kind of organize our thoughts around it. And so with these five focus areas that we had, we were exploring ideas like, does the community understand the connection between climate change and human health? How do we strengthen the capacity of our community to be able to respond to a disaster? How do we get our own house in order in the city to make sure we're organized after a disaster? And it led into this area, which ultimately broke down into our, our strategy development in these three vision areas. We're talking about connect, adapt, and recover. We want to connect neighbors to each other in their city. We want to adapt to uncertain natural hazards and fluctuating economic cycles. And we want to begin recovering today for tomorrow's challenges. In, the, in our session that we're going to have in the breakout, we're going to be talking about some of these goals in more detail. What we've tried to do is, as we said, as we took that step back for 18 months, is try to say, okay, let's get this down to a clear, concise set of resilience goals for the city and county of San Francisco. When people open that resilience strategy, I want there to be no question of how San Francisco defines resilience. So through these goals, and then talking about ADAPT, and talking about changing some of our most vulnerable housing stock, not only for sea level rise, but also for earthquakes, trying to combine the idea of, of a multi-hazard approach in, in, in our thinking. And then with recovery, you know, you heard the mayor talk about keeping our population here. That's probably the single biggest thing that we're focused on after a disaster. We wanna make sure we keep people in their homes, if we can't keep them in their homes, we wanna keep them in their neighborhoods, and if we can't keep them in their neighborhoods, we wanna keep them in the city. Now to do that, we have to take a very, very big step forward. We have to think about repairing homes rapidly after a disaster. You heard LaToya mention the fact that the 70%, 30% owners renters ratio, that's a big deal for San Francisco. Most of the repair programs are set up for single family homeowners. That's only 30% of our population. And those are the people who are already fairly stable. How are we gonna worry about the renters that are barely holding on today to stay in the city? If a disaster happens and they're moved out to outside of the Bay Area, they're not coming back. That's the reality. So we need to think about creating a process. So how do we not only take care of ourselves in the communities, but how do we get the city back up and running as quickly as possible after the disaster? Some of the issues that we're looking at, uh, you know, when we talk about major infrastructure, like our city's seawall. Uh, we have a seawall down at our waterfront that's not ready for sea level rise. It's not ready for a major earthquake. It's got every major utility passing through it. And the Transbay tube that takes hundreds and thousands of people in and out of the city on BART every single day. Um, this is a piece of infrastructure that if we don't think critically about it now, it's going to be a big disaster once that earthquake happens. So working with Rebuild by Design, some of the folks that were involved after uh, Hurricane Sandy in New York, um, we're, we're turning a design competition on its head. So we're trying to make the conversation, not what does our waterfront look like in terms of the built environment, but let's talk about what's below that. Let's talk about the infrastructure. And let's talk about how we come up with a plan to not only conceptualize what our waterfront can be in terms of fighting off earthquakes and fighting off sea level rise, but also in terms of a community-led approach. Because we know if we take that approach, we're, we're gonna decouple the politics to some extent about what it means to build on the waterfront in San Francisco. And for those of you who are from here know that that can be slightly contentious when we start talking about that. We did a lot of work with Harvard Kennedy School. You heard the mayor mention that and you heard Daniel mention that as well. Um, they've been integral in coming up with an implementation plan for the housing strategy that I just mentioned. We talked to them about keeping our people here after a disaster and they spent six months working on different teams and ultimately coming up with the strategy that we're rolling out right now in February. So it's really exciting to see that work coming to fruition and exciting to be rolling that out into the neighborhoods in 2016. Um, here's our URL, there's some more information on there. Um, also our mailing list, if you go to our webpage, sfgov.org backslash ESIP, there's a link right there to sign up on our mailing list. It's usually the best way to keep in touch with what we're doing. And I thank you very much for your time and I'm uh, glad you're all here today.
If you'd like to learn more about the Neighborhood Empowerment Network and programs such as the Empower Communities Program, as well as about all the amazing partners that we have working together every day to build a more resilient future for our communities, visit EmpowerSF.org. Sign up for our newsletter and stay in touch.